And yet, despite all of the things that had gone wrong in the 1830s, O'Connell decided to carry on. And in 1840, he unveiled a new movement, the Repeal Association, that he would continue the work, but instead, he would make it national. He would not try and win repeal inside of Parliament, but outside of Parliament. But for the first three years, there wasn't really very much momentum in the organisation. People again began to mutter, O'Connell's lost it, he's too old, he's repeating himself. He seemed to have run out of speeches. He would give the same speech over and over again and people began to become bored. His voice seemed to have lost the energy of the earlier years. And again, people said, this is going nowhere. And in 1843, Daniel O'Connell began the year by announcing, this is the year of repeal. This is the year we will be victorious. And people laughed, thinking it's nonsense. And early in that year, he challenged Dublin Corporation to a debate on repeal. As part, you see, of uh, his deal with the Whigs, he had got municipal reform so that now they could stand for the, for the corporation. He had actually become Lord Mayor of Dublin, the first Catholic Lord Mayor of Dublin in centuries. And he decided to test this all out by having a debate. And the person who was uh, put in place to, to argue against him was a very conservative professor of political economy at Trinity College Dublin called Isaac Butt. And uh, so the scene was set for a debate between O'Connell and Butt at Dublin Corporation on the merits of repeal. And a week before, O'Connell said, I want to postpone it. I need more time. And everyone began to think, why does he need, he's running scared. And O'Connell said, no, this is all part of the trap. By, by postponing it, people will think that I'm in trouble and therefore it'll generate hype. Everyone will follow it. We'll have loads of journalists at it. And that's exactly what happened. And over a long three-day debate, O'Connell took on, he had, first of all, he'd prepared a new speech. He'd deliver it with passion, with energy. And it seemed like O'Connell was reborn. He was young again. He was in his 68th year, but he seemed like he was a young man in his 20s and 30s again. And people said, O'Connell is back. And afterwards, when people were very critical of Isaac Butt for being his opponent, he turned to him and he said, no, don't be, an en don't, be a don't be hostile to Butt, don't hate him. I studied him during those debates with a microscopic eye. Someday he will be our friend. And that's exactly what happened. He became the leader, the first leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. He fought for home rule until the end of his life. So the victory at that corporation debate convinced O'Connell to go national. To do what he had done in, in Clare for the campaign for emancipation, except now do it everywhere. He would go to every county in Ireland and explain to them why repeal was needed, why it was a good thing. Because a lot of people had never heard O'Connell in person. There was no radio, there was no TV, there was no internet. So people only read newspaper accounts of O'Connell. And he thought, no, what I will do is I will go to all across the country so crowds can come and visit me, families can come, they can have picnics, and I will explain to them why repeal is needed. And the first one was held in Trim in County Meath on the 16th of March, 50,000 people visited. And then the meetings grew, and they grew, 100,000, 200,000, until at Tara on the 15th of August, the Feast of the Assumption, it was estimated by even the government sources, close to a million people. The one at Mullah Mast on the 1st of October, close to a million people. And in all of these, O'Connell set out. He said, if I call on you to fight with me, will you fight? And the crowds would shout, yes. And he said, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want a violent revolution. This isn't worth the shedding of a single drop of blood. We will win this through peaceful means, just as we won emancipation. And as he had grown older, he'd become even more firmly convinced that Irish freedom was not worth the shedding of a single drop of blood. He would sacrifice himself, but he would not sacrifice anyone else. And the government began to become terrified. They said, we know O'Connell is a scoundrel, a liar, a cheat. We don't believe him when he says he won't fight. He could be preparing a revolution. So they began attending these meetings, their spies and informers and police taking notes. One in Skibbereen, O'Connell decided to confuse them. He delivered the entire speech in Irish. 
On other occasions, he said, no, let them take their notes. I've got nothing to hide. And he would bring them to the front and give them tables so they could write all of their notes. And in it, O'Connell was reborn. He grew, took strength from the energy of the people. When uh, something would happen, a horse might break loose, he would just raise his arm and the people would spread and the horse would stop. And they said, this is like a king. This is like a man, an emperor, someone who controls the people. And the government became terrified. And there was a big meeting down in Mallow in the summer where the cabinet discussed declaring these meetings illegal and arresting all of these leaders. And O'Connell decided to send a message to the government. So he asked the journalists to record his words very carefully. And he delivered his regular monster meeting speech. Monster meetings, by the way, was a term that the British press called these meetings as a term of abuse. But it actually uh, proved so popular that everyone began using it and it became uh, a popular term for them. Uh, because there were such huge crowds going. Well, at this meeting in Mallow, O'Connell gave his usual speech, and there was always a banquet afterwards, and O'Connell would usually give a speech after the dinner. And that evening, as the harpist was playing some music and singing a song, O'Connell was deep in a reverie. And he was listening to the words the singer was singing. And there were the words of that Thomas Moore melody, Oh, where is the slave so lowly, condemned to chains unholy? And when O'Connell heard those words, he stood up and he shouted, I am not that slave. I am not that slave. I will never consent to be that slave. And the crowd jumped to their feet and they began shouting back, we are not those slaves. We are not those slaves. We will never consent to be those slaves. And it was like a prayer revivalist meeting. It was incredible the way he got so much energy. And the, and the British uh, reporters went back terrified saying, my God, there could be a revolution if he just says the word. And so they did nothing and allowed the meetings to carry on. And I think that story is a great example of O'Connell the showman. Because O'Connell had used the exact same trick during the debate with Isaac Butt. He had quoted those lines of Thomas Moore and then he began shouting, I am not that slave. And what you see in Mallow is that he had gone up to the harpist before the dinner and he asked the harpist, do you know any of those Thomas Moore melodies? Yeah. Do you know the one about the slave so lowly, condemned to chains unholy? Will you sing that during the dinner? And then he pretended to be in a reverie, alone with his thoughts, so that he could spontaneously jump up at his cue, like the great showman and actor that he was, and bring the crowd with him. And that was the genius of O'Connell. He was an actor, he was a showman, he was a performer, he was an orator, and the people loved him for it. So after that, the government was terrified. There was another meeting. These meetings continued on all throughout the summer into the autumn. O'Connell was traveling all around the country. It's estimated that he traveled three and a half thousand miles in the six month period. And that was incredible when the roads were bad, you were on a carriage, it was exhausting. And this was a man who turned 68 on the 6th of August. And yet he was a young man. He was like a boxer. When he'd finish a speech, they would put a, a towel around his neck. They would give him an orange to chew on. Uh, uh, they would give him all of these things for his energy. And then he would go to the dinner and give another speech, sometimes two speeches that evening. It was an incredible time. The year of the monster meetings, the year of repeal. Uh, at the meeting at Tara, where almost a million people went and his voice booming, projecting across the, across the crowds. Uh, they presented him at one of these meetings with a crown. Well, it was a, a velvet cloth, but it had a gold band. And when they knelt down, and Tara was the place where they had crowned the old High Kings of Ireland, they knelt down before him and they said, we, our only regret is that this is not a cross, a crown made out of gold. And they crowned him. And when the British had this reported back, in their accounts, it was a crown. It was gold. And O'Connell was so chuffed, he said, I'll wear this for the rest of my life. And he did. And, and so the government said, he's crowning himself. He's becoming the king. He also decided that, you know, we should call a repeal assembly in Dublin. 300 me members. Now, that was the exact same number as the old Irish House of Commons. In other words, he was effectively restoring the Irish Parliament. He decided that they would have their own law courts 
uh, with their own magistrates hearing cases in Ireland. Now, these were the things, the tactics, that the Irish revolutionaries did in 1919 to 1921 during the Irish War of Independence. They called their own parliament. They had their own magistrates, their own law courts. O'Connell was putting in place the exact same thing in 1843, and the government decided to act. After a huge meeting at Mullamast on the 1st of October, the scene of a notorious uh, uh, massacre in Queen Elizabeth's day, where again close to a million went, they decided that the next meeting at Clontarf, the following Sunday, the 8th of October, would be declared illegal. They sent in gunboats, they sent in the army, they issued a proclamation that if anyone turned up at Clontarf, they would open fire and massacre them. Now, Clontarf was very symbolic. It was the scene of Brian Boru's great victory, the greatest victory in Irish military history in 1014. It would have been a great place for a monster meeting. And now O'Connell was faced with the greatest decision of his life. And he made the decision which I think he's never been forgiven for in this country. He decided to cancel that meeting. He could not stand over and see the Irish people walk into a massacre. He would sacrifice his own life, but he couldn't sacrifice anyone else. And so he cancelled the meeting. And so many Irish nationalists ever, ever since have blamed him for that. They said, if he had gone ahead, so what if they opened fire? So what if the people were massacred? That would have kick-started a revolution. That would have been our war of independence. That would have got rid of the British. But O'Connell, even if he thought that could have happened, couldn't have had that honest conscience, the massacre of innocent people. He just could not allow it. And so he ordered the cancellation of the meeting. And I think the thing that saved his reputation in the immediate aftermath is the government swooped and they arrested O'Connell and they arrested the other leaders and they put them on trial for treason. And O'Connell defended himself in court and he said, what, how is this treason? Everything that you're saying against me, I said in public. Sometimes there was a million people there. Your own police were there, your soldiers were there. If it was illegal, how come I wasn't arrested then? Everything I did was said in public. You have pointed to no acts of violence during these monster meetings. Oh wait, there was one act of violence. On one occasion, a woman who had a gingerbread stand that was almost knocked over. And he said, that was the only violence. A gingerbread stand that didn't even knock over, but it, it almost fell over. This is ridiculous. But the court had been rigged against O'Connell. There were 77 eligible Catholic jurors in Dublin at that time, compared to 700 Protestant eligible jurors. But when the jury book was presented, so they could uh, randomly, randomly select the names, the pages of the 77 Catholic jurors had been mysteriously ripped out. And so an entirely Protestant jury was picked with all the judges Protestant. And so it was rigged from the beginning. And O'Connell was found guilty of treason. He was sentenced to two years in prison. And in a way, the Irish repeal movement was never as strong as again. Uh, his health uh, I think never recovered either from the time in prison or either from the exertions of travelling around the country for the times of the monster meetings. Whatever the case, his time in prison changed O'Connell and that was to have a major impact on the repeal movement afterwards.